host, welcome to 11.95. <coughs> we will continue with the right Hegelian paradigm. This much underestimated philosopher by me, amongst others, I imagine. Uh, I would dwell deep into his thinking and to try to lay it clear in the open, his main points. But it's important to remember that uh, Whitehead, Alfred North Whitehead, was the first philosopher of importance to admit into the equation also what is quantum mechanics, what is the working of quantum mechanics. So we continue with the same article from the communal edition, the first book about time. You will find more in the description. Whitehead's theory of perception to find the key to Whitehead's philosophy and to show how he can avoid the bifurcations discussed above one has to consider how he conceives of the origin of every possible knowledge. Whitehead regards this origin to lie in everyone's daily experiences. The set of metaphysical notions rests itself upon the ordinary average experience of mankind, properly interpreted. Whitehead directly takes up the starting point of the British empiricists. One, every experience has its origin in perception. The primary ideas of conception, perception join secondary ideas which are deduced by reflection to put sense data into an order. Three, in addition to these two starting points of British empiricists, Whitehead integrates psychic impressions like emotions, beauty, love, satisfaction, and others. Whitehead's theory of perception is of greater universality than the theory of perception of the British empiricists because he integrates all moments of experience. Whitehead is, like Kant, an empirical realist, but in contrast to Kant, he rejects the position of transcendental idealism. He avoids Kant's idealism realism doubling through enlarging the theory of perception by a mode which he calls causal efficacy. In addition to the traditional mode of presentational immediacy. If Whitehead were to restrict himself to the theory of perception of the British empiricists, he would be subjected to the false conclusion that reality is constituted of static isolated substances. But it is one of Whitehead's goals to break up the nominalistic concept of reality and to oppose bifurcation by a simple location. One can only avoid the fallacy of simple location if one takes reality as a network of relations. Relations do not fit into a substance philosophy 
which takes the final constituents of reality as static substrata. Relations have a certain independence with regard to substances because they are not tied to the present of their relata. Whitehead can do justice to the relations in sense perception due to the extension of the theory of perception by the mode of causal efficacy. However, it is important to note that actual sense perceptions do neither occur in pres pres presentational immediacy nor in causal efficacy. The they occur in the mode of symbolic reference, which renders presentational immediacy and causal eff efficacy as abstractions, and combines the two into a concept referring to what perception means concretely. Presentational immediacy, next paragraph. In presentational immediacy, we perceive our surrounding directly. Presentational immediacy is a two-termed relation between the observer and the sense datum. Presentational immediacy expresses how contemporary events are relevant to each other and yet preserve a mutual independence called SYM. Sense perception have their Sense perception have their origin in perceiving external sense data by the sense organs. In contrast to the empirical understanding of given sense data, which are transmitted to consciousness by sense organs, the transmission is an integral part of the situation and is as original as the sense data. In addition, sense perception depends on the present state of the bodily organization. It takes place against the background of preoccupations, preconceptions, what we have before. In the mode of presentational immediacy, the percipient is not aware of these preconceptions of the body as an amplifier. Amplifier of sense data. What appears to us directly as the sense datum is already an abstraction of a temporally extended process. It is an abstraction of an extended reality. Although presentational immediacy in fact has the duration of the specious present, something we mentioned before, this temporal extension is short enough to provide apparently static representations of reality. A quote from Whitehead, the shorter the stretch of time, the simpler are the aspects of the sense presentation contained within them. 
the perplexing effects of change are diminished and in many cases can be neglected. Nature has restricted the acts of thought which endeavor to realize the content of the present to stretches of time sufficiently short to secure this static simplicity over the greater part of the sense stream. Sense perception perceived in presentational immediacy are like mental photographs which abstract from the camera, that is the sense organs of the body, and the components of the exposure process, especially the exposure time, which is temporality, how long the camera is open with its shutter, its exposure time, that is temporality. So you see, on both sides of the connection or the entanglement, the extension of temporality and the order of things are very important. And of course, so is space. Sense perception perceived in presentational immediacy are like mental photographs which abstract from the camera, sense organs of the body, and the components of the exposure process, especially the exposure time. This is an important clue. At each instant of time, the camera delivers sharp representations, sense perception in the mood of presentational immediacy, abstracts from the temporal experiences. It does not deliver any information about future or past, but only about the sense data and their spatial positions. One important element in judging a photograph is the choice of the motif. This points to a degree of freedom in presentational immediacy. It is, to a large extent, controllable at will. This degree of freedom is attention. In your lives, in our own lives, and at every one moment, there is a focus of attention. And I think I mentioned this before, this is the focal setting. This is one side and that's the other side. The sharpness of that is like a mono binocular or mon monocular extender magnifier microscope it could be as well sense perception in the mode of presentational immediacy abstracts from temporal experiences. It does not deliver any information about future nor past, but only about the sense data and their spatial positions. One important element in judging a photograph is the choice of motif. This points to a degree of freedom in presentational immediacy. It is, to a large extent, controllable at will. This degree of freedom is attention. In our lives and at any one moment, there is a focus of attention, a few items in clarity of awareness, but interconnected vaguely and yet instantly with other items in dim apprehension and this dimness shading off imperceptibly into in undiscriminate feeling. 
<coughs> by means of attention, the body becomes an integral part of sense perception. Attention directs the perception of the perceiver and determines the selection of the sense data. In this process, the penetration of intuition follows upon the expectation of thought. This is the secret of attention. The direction of perception depends on the interests of the perceiver. In this sense, empiricism is confined within immediate interests. Interest is connected to an expectation of sense data. Attention compromises a teleological and temporal aspect. The analysis of po past data directs the attention to future data. This results in the selection of relevant information for the integration process of perception. But the analysis of past data is not the subject of presentational immediacy any longer. It belongs to the mode of causal efficacy. efficacy. Attention is the relation between presentational immediacy and causal efficacy. Directed attention in Whitehead's philosophy must not be understood according to the normal usage of the word attention. This is incredibly important. Do put a note on attention here. Focal setting This is the movement where the barrier between the two goes and if you decide to call one subject or something else but remember it doesn't have to be subject that is incredibly important to put into your head quantum mechanics in contrast to classical physics does not indirectly assume a subject and an object that would be to assuming that I'm hypothesized that would in itself be a breakage to what quantum mechanics want to do So attention is the faucet, faucet, uh, el chorro in espanol, faucet is kranen, eller flaskhalsen, som avgör vad som egentligen upplevs. When a hungry cat watches a mouse, she does not have the freedom to turn away. Normally, Animals do not perceive in the mood of presentational immediacy, but only in causal effic efficiency, efficacy. If the mouse did not act on the cat, the cat would not see her. This attention is a kind of reaction by reflex action. Animals react to their environment by adapting to it. Conformity is only perceivable by means of causal efficacy. Humans perceive in the mode of presentational immediacy in the addition to causal efficiency, efficacy. 
all scientific observations such as measurements, determinations of relative spatial position, determinations of sense data such as colors, sounds, tastes, smells, temperatures, feeling, touch, feelings again, etc. are made in the perceptive mood of the presentational immediacy. In contrast, physical theories exclusively refer to causal efficacy. Summary. Perception is the presentational immediacy provide the spatial aspects of the perception process. The main topics concerning presentational immediacy are 1. Sense perceptions depend on the spatial relationships between the perceiver and the sense data. Temporal aspects are ignored. 3. Perception is a presentational immediacy, contributes to the experience of only a few high developed organisms. Causal efficacy, which is a tough nut to crack. Whitehead's deliberation about perception in the mode of causal efficacy arises from his criticism of the perception theory of the British empiricists, as well as the transcendental idealists. The result is an extension of their theory of perception, Hume's fundamental philosophy is that one, presentational immediacy and relations between presentational immediacy, immediate entities, constitutes the only type of perceptive experience, and that two, presentational immediacy includes no demonstrative factors disclosing a contemporary world of extended actual things. The consequence is that only sense perceptions of pure, private nature will be uncovered in visual perception. It is impossible to found space, time and identity with regard to reality upon, upon, upon these perceptions. Hume is restricted to the present moment. Whitehead calls this restriction, following Santayana, the solipsism of present moment. The starting point of Whitehead's philosophy is his observation that sense perception is in, pres <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. in presentational immediacy does not do justice to all moments of experience. Therefore, he introduces the mode of causal efficacy in addition to presentational immediacy. The ontological basis of his realism is to be found in his theory of the extensive continuum. Generally, all items of the world are temporally and spatially 
extended and connected with each other. For this reason, one has to consider the universe as a process. If reality is empirically perceivable, then relations have to be perceivable too. This is impossible if all knowledge is founded in presentational immediacy alone. In this case, there were no empirical knowledge of an extensive continuum, and it were impossible to perceive the phenomena of the world properly. In contrast to Hume and Kant, Whitehead finds sufficient evidence for causal connection and temporal continuity in direct sense perception. The tacit presupposition for the demonstration of this evidence is the experience of temporal and spatial extension. Temporal extension, in particular, underlies the significance of perception in the mode of causal efficacy. Temporally adjoining events are present contemporaneously in the special, special present, and they are perceived together. Later events confirm the content of earlier ones. This is a basic datum of our experiences. Spatio-temporal relations and the perception are the reason for our knowledge of an extensive continuum. Actually, Kant accept that causal efficacy is a fact of the phenomenolog phenomenological world but in Whitehead's opinion, he insists erroneously that it is not part of sense perception. For Kant, causal efficacy is only one way of thinking because he accepts uncritically Hume's presupposition that the phenomenological world is constituted of a series of momentary events. Hmm, very sharply noted. Hume's presupposition is attributed to a reduced concept of time. For Whitehead, momentary events are already abstractions from actual occasions. To accept this reduced concept of time as ultimate is an example of the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Kant justify his position by the experience that in each instance one perceives only details of reality and never reality as a whole. Partial perceptions present only partial data of reality, but one makes valid statements about the whole of reality. Such general knowledge cannot be deduced from the finite partial aspects of reality. Any universal validity of the description of nature can never be legitimated by sense data alone. For this reason, Kant founds the phenomenological world upon an effort of coherent judgments. For Whitehead, Kant's philosophy is an attempt to show how subjective experiences are processed into objectivity. Whitehead tries just the opposite. He wants to show how objectively experienced entities produce subjective capacity as they are experienced in a temporal act, which is not reducible 
to intellectual faculties, the specious present. We have a little footnote there. Oh, uh, <coughs> Note 8, the specious present compared to Kant's philosophy. The philosophy of organism is the inversion of Kant's philosophy. For Kant, the world emerges from the subject. For the philosophy of organism, the subject emerges from the world. For Kant, the process whereby there is experience is a process from subjectivity to apparent objectivity. The philosophy of organism inverts this analysis and explains the process as proceeding from objectivity to subjectivity, namely from the objectivity whereby the external world is a datum to the subjectivity whereby there is one individual experience. The starting point for any consciousness consists of the data of the external world. In the specious present, the events with their spatial and temporal extensions are directly perceived. The track of a spark emitted by a fire, as an example, can be perceived as one form in the specious present. But the perception of forms does not answer the question as to whether we can really perceive causality. One cannot identify temporally extended experience with the experience of causality. However, the specious present does not contain unique perceived events alone, it also includes the immediate past. Causal efficacy is the hand of the settled past in the formation of the present. The presence of immediately past events shows that present and future events have to fit with earlier events in the same way that immediately past events had to fit with more distantly past events. Causal efficacy is the confirmation of the present to the immediate past and both the immediate past and its relevance to the present are experienced. Whitehead calls the presence of past events in causal efficacy non sensus perception. Causal efficacy contains a concept of causality which is not intended to predict future events but to describe past events. Causality in Whitehead's philosophy means that we never perceive a series of events alone, but that later events arise from earlier events in the specious present. Perception in causal efficacy are vague, persistent, urgent, uncontrollable, 
whereas perception in presentational immediacy are exactly defined, easy to reproduce and to manage. So we have two modes here, the causal effic efficacy, efficacy, oh, how should I pronounce it? Causal efficacy. Causal efficacy is the mode of the classical physics. It's unclear. It is deemed out. Uh, it doesn't really do the trick of presenting a world clear. It is impossible to reproduce. It can be compared with the dim lit. Also, efficacy and that is the confirmation of the present to the immediate past and both the immediate past and its relevance to the present are experienced. Whitehead calls the presence of past events in causal efficacy nonsensus perception that is because it is in the past causal efficacy contains a concept of causality and this is important which is not intended to predict future events but to describe past events so this is the human take this I put it this orders itself into causality of the past, very important. And this is also what 99% of the population use to predict the future. And you can see already now possibly or will understand that is absolutely impossible to use parts of the past to predict the future could be done in a mechanical forehanded way in a very very small section of reality maybe if you work in a factory that produces dish brushes or something like that you can measure the length the weight of them and thereby predict the outcome you hear also here this is mentioning of dish brushes is not an incident or accident this of course was further strengthened indirectly by the Industrial Revolution. We stop thinking that this is what thinking is. It is not what thinking is. We know that can predict the future. We have to predict the future. But thank God in the modern era, we don't have to do it so much. I put it in pause here. <laughs> <gasps> Sorry. Causal effic efficacy contains a concept of causality 
<coughs> which is not intended to predict future events, but to describe past events. And this is very similar to a posteriori make an explanation and thereby enforcing causal change. <coughs> Think about the people watching the game of Roger Federer. They will see a causal chain. First he picks up his ball. <coughs> he places in front of the racket and he gives it a smash over to you. Boris Becker or whoever might be on the other side on the receiving end of the ball. Causality in Whitehead's philosophy means that we never perceive, perceive a series of events alone, but that later events arise from earlier events in the specious pre present. Perceptions in causal efficacy are vague, persistent, urgent, and uncontrollable. Whereas presentations in presentational immediacy are exactly defined, easy to reproduce and to manage. Vaguely, uh, I can say here in parenthesis, there is a parallel causal effic effic efficacy, that focal setting, that mode of attention or low attention is similar, similar to the Kantian, Humean, Leibnizian, Newtonian way of thinking or being or perceiving. And it's not an ideology, it is not something that can be understood other than with the body and mind in, in concert action. It has to be actively understood. Causality is perceivable in the comparison of present occasions with immediate past occasions. The present event issues subject to the limitation laid upon it by actual nature of the immediate past. The complete analysis of the past must disclose in it those factors which provide the conditions for the present. It's elegantly put very clear. So you can have a comparison. This is not exactly the same thing, but what Whitehead is pointing out is a faux pas, to say the least, on behalf of Hume, Kant, Newton, Leibniz also, and is missing out that not distinguishing between causal efficacy and presentational immediacy. Presentational immediacy is what gives and causal efficacy is the extracted, derived if you like, secondary. But I use these terms not very liberally because this is not what we usually call by derived. We need quantum mechanics to understand what we used to think is primary is derived from the potentiality, which is clearer, sharper, and more defined, and gives the substance to understand. Causal efficacy cannot do that because it is secondary in this sense already situated in time and space, not being time and space.
it's a different way of looking at it. It is said that my parallel is that subject and object distinctions are assumed since pre-Socratian times. This is a tough nut to crack, but it could also be a pointer. And it seeps into all philosophy and all thinking. And what quantum mechanic is disclosing, it's an unjust, unconscious hypothesis, so to speak. But it is rather a way of being that immediately puts the subject into space, place, and immediately, or do not even consider, is incapable from that position. I think that's the most correct. Once the border is laid unbeknownst by yourself, it is impossible to disclose or reveal that what happened before. And therefore, you will always start with the subject and derive the objective from the subject. Whitehead is pointing to that quantum mechanics and it's absolutely fabulous. Quantum mechanics do the opposite. It looks from what objective standpoint, that is presentational immediacy, do we get the subjective. Subjective is a special way of being. It is not foundational. Here, the press, presentational immediacy is the real, the direct, the clear, the one with the border, the one with differences, not as dim as a, a causal efficacy. Conformity finds its expression in the behavior of lower developed organisms. Plants and animals come to terms with facts as they found them in their surroundings. Quote, in its lowest form, mental experience is canalized into slavish conformity. It is merely the appetition towards or from whatever in fact already is. The slavish thirst in a desert is a mere urge from intolerable dryness. This lowest form of slavish conformity pervades all nature. It is degraded to, be, to being merely one of the actors in the efficient causation. So plants and animals, they are on the lower grade because for them there are only objects. They are cut in stone, whereas presentational immediacy is truer to the before, what is happening that causes all these things. So you both have the objects, but also what causes them, the more real thing. As you remember from the former lecture, objects are abstractions that can be usable, but they are hardly shared by every, anyone. Besides the conformity of temporally neighboring events, the transmission process of sense data into the mind is an additional argument for perception in causal efficacy. The percipient experience the sense perceptions as depending on his body with its physiological properties. For example, in touch there is a reference to the stone in contact with the hand and a reference to the hand, but in normal, healthy bodily operations, the chain of occasions along the arm sinks into the background almost into complete oblivion. 
Thus, M, man which has some analytic consciousness of its statum, is conscious of the feeling in its hand as the hand touches the stone. According to this account, perception in its primary form is consciousness of the causal efficacy of the eternal world by reasons of which the percipient is concrescence from a definitely constituted datum. The vector character of the datum of this causal efficacy Immediate sense perceptions are the result of a transmission process which is already past. Our bodily experience is primarily an experience of the dependence of presentational immediacy upon causal efficacy. Perception is a causal efficacy in a causal efficacy avoids the solipsism of the present moment because it points to the fact that sense perception compromises more than one perceives in presentational immediacy and that presentational immediacy depends on this more Summary. Present perceptions in causal efficacy contain the temporal aspects of the process of reality. These aspects are directly perceived in sense perception. Whitehead gives three arguments for perception in causal efficacy. One, perception in the specious present. Two, Perception that the present comes out of the past. Perception of stimulus reaction chains. Those are the animalistic, the last, the latter. While the former are also clearly classical physics. Three, three. <clears throat> Symbolic reference. Sense perception never takes place in one of the pure modes of presentation, presentational immediacy or causal efficacy, but only in the complex mode of symbolic reference, which connects the two. Sense perceptions in symbolic reference possesses only a symbolic content. As a result of the fusion of the two pure and abstract modes of perception, real perception in symbolic reference is the reason of errors and misinterpretations. Symbolic reference is an active synthetic element of the perceiver which produces emotions convictions and beliefs concerning other elements of reality. It delivers a secure ground of experience only if it fulfills certain criteria which are demanded by the pure modes of perception. One of these criteria is the consistency of perceptions. indistinctness and ambiguity in symbolic reference lead to mistakes which are not to be found in the reference of concepts but in the process of perception. Sense perceptions are not basic elements as British empiricists believed. They are 
rather located at a higher level of abstraction. Sense perceptions are more than sense impressions of sense data. They also, it's a quote, they also represent the conditions arising out of the active perceptive functioning as conditioned by our own natures, end of quote. In sense perception, the data of reality are transformed by the subjective form of perception in which the emotional state of the perceiver and the specific state of the sense organs are included. An event of reality emits an emotional form which produces a stimulus in the sense organ and results in a corresponding sense perception. The more primitive types of experience are concerned with sense reception and not with sense perception. Emotional forms contain the rough data as they are emitted by the events. They are not specialized and not distinguished in different objects. Symbols are those components of the sense process which produces emotions, convictions and beliefs elements of reality that produces sense stimuli are denoted as meanings by Whitehead. The relation between symbols and meanings indicates symbolic reference. Symbolic reference describes the transition from the more simple elements, the meanings to the simple elements, the symbols. Knowledge of this relation alone does not designate with relatum, which relatum is the symbol and which the meaning. Hmm, very interesting. Symbolic reference describes the transition from the more simple elements the meanings to the simple elements, the symbols. Knowledge of this relation alone does not designate which relatum is the symbol and which the meaning. There is no element in our experience which is only symbol or only meaning. In symbolic reference, the more complex elements points to the simple ones. Thereby, sense perception proceeds from the simpler elements to the more complex. The transitions from without to within the body marks the passage from the lower to the higher grades of actual occasions. Thus the transmitted datum acquires sense-enhanced in relevance or even changed in character by the passage from the low-grade external world into the intimacy of the human body. Analyzing sense perceptions in the mode of symbolic reference and searching for the meanings, one has to concentrate on those elements which both your moods of perception have in common. 
one finds that these elements in the sense datum presentational immediacy dense deals with the same datum as does causal efficacy. The elements themselves are the presented loci and the eternal objects, of course, of Plato. Quote, the partial community of structure whereby the two perceptive modes yield immediate demonstration of a common world arises from their reference to sense data common to both, to localization diverse or identical in a spectrotemporal system common to both. So what we think is communal reality is actually we use in the same reference system. But what is in the beetle box is unique for everyone and strictly not shared. And that is causal efficacy. However, you could say, presentational immediate immediacy abstracts totally from sense objects. It marks the immediate phenomena whereas causal efficacy refers to their spatiotemporal relationships. <coughs> Both modes of perception are interwoven with each other and it's difficult to separate them. For example, color is referred to an external space and to the eyes as organs of vision. Insofar as we are dealing with one or the other of these pure perceptive modes, such reference is direct demonstration and as isolated in conscious analysis is ultimate fact against which there is no appeal. Such isolation, or at least some approach to it, is fairly, to, fairly easy in the case of presentational immediacy, but is very difficult in the case of causal efficacy. Complete, ideal purity of perceptive experience, devoid of any symbolic reference, is in practice unattainable for either perceptive mode. The quote from Whitehead here. Our natures must conform to the causal efficacy, thus the causal efficacy from the past is at least one factor giving our presentational immediacy in the present. The how of our present experience must confirm to the what of the past in us. End of quote. Critics of Whitehead's philosophy very often fail to see that the, he considers actual perception as a synthesis of two different modes of perception. Empirical scientific research takes place in presentational immediacy exclusively, but its representation takes place in causal efficacy. 
all scientific theory is stated in terms referring exclusively to the scheme of relatedness, which so, so far as it is observed, involves the perception in the pure mode of causal efficacy. Whitehead does not introduce a new kind of bifurcation here, because the basic unity of sense perception is presented in a symbolic reference. Causal efficacy and presentational immediacy are abstractions. Causality is an integral component of reality and an aspect which is uncovered in immediate perception. Time. Time in Whitehead's Natural Philosophy, 1914 to 25. So this is the later Whitehead. <clears throat> in each stage of the development of his philosophy, Whitehead expresses that space and time do not exist by their own. Space-time cannot, in reality, be considered as a self-subsistent entity. It is an abstraction and its explanation requires reference to that from which it has been extracted. <coughs> Reality is extended. Space and time are abstractions from extended events and they are experienced empirically. In his natural philosophy, nature exists only as a whole as a continuously flowing process. Thus, an entity is an abstraction from the concrete, which in its fullest sense means totality. Any factor, by virtue of its status as a limitation within totality, necessarily refers to factors of totality other than itself. It is therefore impossible to find anything finite. Every part receives meaning only in relation to the whole. What the scientist accepts as the elements or parts of the whole are in reality abstractions. In actuality, this is important, remember this. <laughs> in actuality, the part exists and has meaning by virtue of the whole. The parts have meaning by virtue of the whole. You can say vice versa. Same lesson coming from Carlo Rovelli, Henry Stapp, and Chris Fields to say the whole is more than the parts is doesn't make any sense Temporally extended events do not exist by their own. They are parts of an extended nature and the duration is the specious present. 
of a perceiver. The present is extended. It is not a non-extensional now, like in logocentrism or the logophysics of here. For this reason, time does not have any reality in nature, listen to this, but is only a property of a perceiver, who or what that might be. Therefore, Whitehead does not have any problems in considering momentary events as ultimately given data for philosophical analysis. Reality is an extensive continuum and events are arbitrary parts which are simplified by abstraction. The continuity of nature arises from extension. Every event extends over other events and every event is extended over by other events. Every duration is part of other durations and every duration has other durations which are parts of it. Accordingly there are no maximum durations and no minimum durations. Thus, there is no atomic structure of duration and the perfect definition of a duration so as to mark out its individuality and distinguish it from highly analogous durations over which is it, it is passing or which are passing over it is an arbitrary postulate of thought. Sense awareness posits durations as factors in nature but does not clearly enable thought to use it as distinguishing the separate individualities of entities of an allied group of slightly differing durations. End of quote. Events do not have any reality independent of consciousness and they do not have definite temporal extensions. Time relations are an expression of an ordering relation imposed by a receiver. Space-time is nothing else than a system of pulling together of assemblages into unities. But the word event just means one of these spatial temporal unities. Physical time only deals with certain formal relational aspects of our changing human experience. Relative to other abstractions, space and time offer a comparatively simple structure which is suitable as a basis for objective distinctions in reality. In the specious present one perceives a unity which is already separated into its parts by the activity of the perceiver the parts entertain certain characteristics of which time and space are example. The common structure of space-time conforms to the uniform experiences of sense perception. Time and space are necessary to experience in the sense that they are 
characteristics of our experience. But the unity of sense perceptions is not free from problems. Whitehead's early concept of time has the same problems as Kant had. It is not clear how one can proceed from individual experiences to a uniform space-time structure. In the article Space, Time and Relativity of 1917, Whitehead wrote But I admit that what I have termed the uniformity of the texture of experience is a most curious, thing, curious and arresting fact. I am quite ready to believe that it is a mere illusion, and I suggest that this uniformity does not belong to the immediate relations of the crude data of experience but is the result of substituting for them more refined logical entities, such as relations between relations, or classes of relations, or classes of classes of relations. By these means it can be demonstrated, I think, that the uniformity which must be ascribed to experience is of a much more abstract, attenuated character than is usually allowed. This process of lifting the uniform time and space of the physical world into the status of logical abstractions also have the advantage of recognizing another fact namely the extremely fragmentary nature of all direct individual conscious experience. My point in this respect is that fragmentary individual experiences are all that we know and that all speculation must start from these disjecta members as its sole datum. It is not true that we are directly aware of a smooth running world and of sight. As a consequence, Whitehead's natural philosophy of the period before 1925, accepting that reality is a continuous process, does not represent considerable progress with respect to Kant's concept of time. Temporality of perception is not sufficient to account for causality and time as properties of nature. For two, the epochal theory of time, this is after 25, the transition from momentary events to extended actual occasion in Whitehead's philosophy is not only initiated by the knowledge of perception in the spacious present, but also by logical difficulties within philosophical theories and metaphysical outlines. The difficulties with the traditional concept of continuous time are 1. Perception takes place in a duration. That is the spacious present. 2. Physical description of dynamical processes presupposes the existence of temporal events, 
momentum, velocity, etc. Three, the description of simple physical structures like atoms or biological organisms needs temporal extensions. Four, becoming and continuity are incompatible. Becoming is only possible if reality is constituted of atomic temporal events. This is Zenon's paradox. Now come in, read the book. Five, causal interactions are directly perceivable in the spacious present. Six, momentary events are abstractions. They can be deduced from extensional events by means of the method of extensive abstraction. All these points forced Whitehead to conclude that reality is not based on momentary events, but on temporarily extended events. In parenthesis, he, here he clashes incredibly hard with all contemporary and past philosophy. All philosophy until Derrida or Wittgenstein assumes that moments are separable, and that there are not such a thing as different extensions of time. A moment is, so to speak, a moment. Cannot be different, cannot be longer, cannot be shorter, cannot be individuated. And that is a big cock up to miss that. But it's also understandable. It would have taken a God perspective to understand it. It is impossible because Panopticon doesn't really work, and therefore this understanding cannot come until we discovered it in quantum mechanics. And this is why I over and over again, that's how important quantum mechanics is. That understanding cannot I'll write it down here. That understanding can only, very important, only come from mechanics. Whitehead is post-quantum mechanics, he, although in its very early stages in the beginning of the 20th century, but it's very important to assume that that understanding could have in some ways come earlier. It's a fallacy of thinking that assumes a godlike or even all more omniscience, some sort of omniscience that is impossible, that we have all the facts of the world. I just explained the difference between causal efficacy and uh, perception of immediacy. I think it could be quite clear now of the impossibility of understanding this before quantum mechanics. That will take the panopticon and the homunculus having a beer at the pub 
in East Ham at the, the pub, East Ham Bull. Which is not situated in Turkey, but it's a pub in Surrey. Called the Bull because it lies in East Ham. That understanding can only come from quantum mechanics. You cannot, you cannot sit under a tree, get an apple in your head and understand this. No, it can only come from reality itself because it is a perception of immediacy. It's an observation. And observations are one part direct perceptual immediacy is one part of the thing. The other one is causal efficacy. All these points forced Whitehead to conclude that reality is not based on momentary events, but on temporally extended events. Yet he needed additional justification to transfer the notion of duration to the events of reality. He did not find such justification until the early development of the quantum theory, whose first results motivated him to apply basic elements of philosophy and psychology to all events of reality. Although Whitehead, sorry, Yet he needed additional justification to transfer the notion of duration to the events of reality. He did not find such justification until the early development of the quantum theory, whose first results motivated him to apply basic elements of philosophy and psychology to all events of reality. Although Whitehead probably did not study the theoretical foundations of quantum theory in detail, some developments of the early quantum theory led him to speculative philosophy especially Bohr's atom model of 1913 and the Broglie's wave theory of 24, inspired him to critically re-examine his natural philosophy and gain explicit entry into the chapter The Quantum Theory in Science and Modern World. The particles of reality are no longer material static forms, but spatio-temporally extended events. Whitehead explains that the change from materialism to organic realism is a displacement of the notion of static stuff by the notion of fluent energy. Such energy has its structure of action and flow and is inconceivably apart from such structure. It is also conditioned by quantum requirements. This shows that he got his inspiration from scientific discoveries without going into specific details of the formalism. His doctrine of the epochal character of time depends on the analysis of the intrinsic character of an event considered as the most concrete finite entity, which he calls actual occasion. 
in his epochal theory of time, Whiteide unifies four different aspects of time, which one finds in the experience of an actual location. Listen up. Aspects of internal time, passage of thought, becoming and perishing, retentions, for instance, to experience of attention, extension, unlimited act, inner time consciousness, retentions and protensions. Two, aspects of external time, actual physical time, perception of past actual locations, passage of nature, becoming and perishing and second potential physical time extensive continuum to avoid any bifurcations every actual location has to be a factor equal to other factors in the fact of nature a perceiving consciousness is no longer an exception, which is outside of nature, but an inherent part of it. Therefore, every internal aspect of time has an external aspect as an equivalent. Experience of extension corresponds to potential physical time and passage of thought corresponds to the passage of nature. The physical concept of time unifies two experiences, the experience of an extensive continuum and the perception of concrete actual occasions, thereby it unifies discontinuity and continuity of the external world in one concept. And this is very important. In classical physics we get several concepts, at least two, which causes confusion. The actual separation of the extensive continuum depends on the prehensions of the occasion of becoming actual. Quote, it is by means of extension that the bonds between prehensions take on the dual aspect of internal relations, which are yet, in a sense, external relations. An actual occasion presents a physical and a mental pole. This means that an actual location is both a physical location as well as a mental location. So we have, in this case, two sides. Only the physical pole has potential extension over the whole extensive continuum and can be divided coordinately. The mental conceptual pole does not share the coordinate divisibility of the physical pole from which the extensive continuum is derived. Similarly, similarly passage of thought in the internal concept of time is confronted with the experience of an unlimited temporal act. Consciousness as a whole is an actual location which is constituted by a society of subordinated actual locations which are the single states of mind. 
every state of mind, every thought is a mental pole of an actual occasion whose passage determines the experience of the mind. A mental pole of an actual occasion has its equivalent in a thought of mind and is an act of attention which has the duration of the spacious presence present. Listen to this. The actual entity is the product of the interplay of physical pole with mental pole. There is a continuum called this physical, called this mental pole. It's a continuum, and this is the entanglement. It is entanglement on not two things that are entangled. Entanglement is two things. The actual entity is the product of the interplay of physical pole with mental pole. In this way, potentiality passes into actuality. Do you get it? And extensive relations mold qualitative content and objectifications of other particulars into a coherent, finite experience. Each actuality is essentially bipolar, physical and mental, so, though mentally is non-spatial, mentality is always a reaction and an integration with physical experience, which is indeed spatial. End of quote. <coughs> Every actual occasion is a spatio-temporal unit which possesses an indivisible volume and a time quantum. Coordinate divisibility provides that each actual location is composed of a number of subordinate actual locations. But just as for some purposes one atomic actuality can be trusted as though it were many coordinate actualities in the same way a nexus like nexus is this way maybe a nexus of many actualities can be treated as it were one actuality. Actual locations express the uniform space-time structure of the universe because their external relations which fit into the actual location into a subordinate actual location and their internal relations which represent the coordinate divisibility into subordinate actual occasions merge into an extensive continuum. This 
listen to this quote. This is rather sharpened up. You can see how White had developed after 25. Blind prehensions, physical and mental, are the ultimate bricks of the physical universe. They are bound together within each actuality by the subjective unity of aim, which governs their ally genesis and their final concrescence. Concrescence means being born together or being becoming together. They are also bound together beyond the limits of their peculiar subjects by the way in which the prehension in one subject becomes the objective datum for the prehension in a later subject, thus objectifying the early subject for the later subject. The two types of interconnection or prehensions are themselves bound together in a common scheme. The relationship of extension so we're no longer pointing out, as I did now, extension is what this makes. Extension is not possible, then we get these classical physical distances instead. That are of the left hemisphere, aka representations, not shared and not understood by the individual as well. Physical time, physical space and creative advance are abstractions which presupposes the more general relationship of extension. The extensiveness of space is really the specialization of extension and the extensiveness of time is really the temporalization of extension. Physical time expresses the reflection of generic divisibility into coordinate divisibility. The spatio-temporal extensive continuum is the general structure to which all actual occasions must conform. The assignment of different aspects of time to the ultimate units of reality becomes possible by transforming the natural philosophical concept of momentary events into actual occasions. In Whitehead's metaphysics, actual occasions are no longer momentary cuts through reality but forms which have the properties of spatio-temporal extension and creativity. In Whitehead's natural philosophy, the events were dependent on the activity of a perceiver. They had no independent reality. One reality as a whole was real. In Whitehead's metaphysics, the actual locations are the ultimate units of reality. They are the real things in the world which have their own being, temporality and creative activity. Whitehead's metaphysics is a consequence of the internal experiences of man with respect to all entities of nature. If one takes into account that the actual world consists of actual occasions, which have different temporal species, different temporal extensions overlapping each other, that one perceives this world in the specious present.
one is able to perceive causal connections directly. One can recognize the development of actual locations along their historical roots and realize how an actual location passes and another one becomes. So that was the end of the second chapter of the book Temporality by Joachim Klose. And important points to be taken here is the speciousness of the present. It is almost always assumed, well it's always assumed that the present doesn't have a temporal extension. It's just a now, and that now has a tendency to become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it almost disappears. The specious present. And then we had causal efficacy. Causal efficacy is the post thing, what happens once we have the immediate perception. Perception is very difficult in Whitehead. His pivotal point of philosophy, and it helps to understand uh, that he got the understanding from quantum mechanics and not from the philosophical tradition. It is exactly not of our normal thinking. So perception Every experience has its origin in perceptions. Normally we think first we have perceptions and then we sort of extract objects, reality from that. He means that there is an immediacy and that is called presentational immediacy. A very simple way of saying causal effic efficacy comes from extending the moment. Just by extension we can get space in the external world to make for causal effects. Presentational immediacy doesn't really, uh, still it is before the spacious moment. These two factors helps incredibly much to understand quantum mechanics although at this point it still sounds rather complicated but it's a way of going about and it needs at least in the end an understanding for what is perception in the philosophy of, of uh, Whitehead 
that is the that will judge or be decisive whether you understand his philosophy or not. I'll give you some time. As usual, these are very tough things. Alfred North Whitehead was excluded when I studied philosophy because of his complexity. Not the way he was writing, but the complexity in understanding what he was pointing to. Hegel was for some reason partly included, although his way of writing really defies understanding. This is not the case when it comes to Whitehead. He writes clearly. He doesn't add any extra. It's rather that quantum mechanics is so hard to understand. Although incredibly much easier with the help of Alfred North Whitehead's novel ideas. And just that he so clearly, directly understood that the all thing of the present novel not having in a temporal extension and objects are possible to be perceived, which is nonsensical. But it's hard to get around. People believing that objects are real and we can perceive them for 2000 500 years. This of course has placed man into the illusion and we can only reach reality indirectly by abstractions. There is nothing less abstract with an object than for instance to say the social stratum of uh, northern Germany in 1945 and their relationship to the production of wheat. It's an object is the same abstraction level. We still need to use them though. Abstraction are not useless. And this is what Whitehead means. We need the both. We need causal efficacy. We need presentational immediacy. We don't presentational immediacy. There is no reality. But we also need to go further. Make pretension, retention, create a sort of a plan. Uh, uh, to get the potentialities into actualities. And that doesn't happen by itself. I will start a little bit with this time temporality from Whitehead to quantum physics, also by Closer. Abstract. I'll read the abstract here. To just finish off this first step into Whitehead and quantum physics. The, quick, the question which has to be answered concerning Whitehead's metaphysics is whether this, his system is completed with process and reality or whether his metaphysics only come, comes fully into view in his later works. It will be argued that his main ideas are already fully developed in process and reality, especially regarding the concept of time. The change of its understanding took place already during his writing of Science and Modern World in 25. Although he probably did not study the theoretical foundations of quantum theory in detail, since there is not a single allusion to any of these developments or to their authors in all of Whitehead's published works. Some developments of the early quantum theory led him to this to his speculative philosophy, especially Bohr's atom model and the Broglie's wave theory. To critically re-examine his natural philosophy 
and gain explicitly entry into the chapter, the quantum theory. From now on, the particles of reality are no longer material, static forms, but spatio-temporal extended events. Do you get it? Spatio-temporal extended events. Sounds like UFOs, but nothing of the kind. You just call that. your temporal extended events. Whitehead got his inspiration from scientific discoveries without necessarily going into the specific formalism. His doctrine of the epochal character of time depends on the analysis of the intrinsic character of an event considered to be the most concrete finite entity which he calls actual occasion now so this is scary close to the wheeler de witt equation where an event is before time and space or rather, an event is not placed in a temporal spatial grid or anything like that. His doctrine of epochal character of time depends on the analysis of the intrinsic character of an event, considered to be the most concrete, finite entity which he calls actual occasion. The change from materialism to Whitehead's organic realism is characterized by the displacement of the notion of static stuff by the notion of fluid energy. Such energy has its structure from action and flowing and is also conditioned by quantum measurements. Both Whitehead's metaphysics and quantum theory are theories of observation. The reality which quantum theory deals with are certain observations by scientists who use the theory. And the issue of Whitehead's speculative cosmology is an expansion and generalization of the theory of perception of the British empiricists. By characterizing the basic ideas of scientific development and their consequences for philosophy, Whitehead wants to unify different views of the, na of the nature of things and to overcome the dualistic tradition of Cartesianism in modern age. Four leading ideas have determined the theoretical sciences in the 19th century. Atomicity, continuity, energy preservation and evolution. According to Whiter, the challenge of sciences were not aimed to introduce these concepts, but to fuse them together and expand their application. Therefore, the cell theory and Pasteur's work were more revolutionary for him than the achievement of Dalton's nuclear theory. 
for they introduced the notion of organism into the world of minute beings. Putting the concept of actual location in the center of his philosophy, he succeeds in resolving handed down contrast in a common unified ground. The world is made of actual locations, each of which arises from potentialities created by prior actual locations. Actual locations are happenings, each of which comes into being and then perishes, only to be replaced by a successor. These experiences like happenings are the basic realities of nature. Similarly, Heisenberg said that what is really happening in quantum process is the emergence of an actual from potentialities created by prior actualities. In the orthodox Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory, the actual things to which the theory refers are increments in our knowledge. These increments are experiential events. The particles of classical physics lose their fundamental status. They dissolve into diffuse clouds of possibilities. At each stage of the unfolding of nature, the complete cloud of possibilities acts like the potentiality for the occurrence of next increment. in knowledge, whose occurrence can radically change the cloud of possibilities and potentialities for the still later increments in knowledge. A philosophy which is founded on causality and teleology as basic description of reality has to dissolve the distinction between inside and outside consciousness and matter, and object and subject. To reach this purpose, Whitehead's philosophy of organism as developed in process and reality offers the starting point. But the question arises whether Whitehead's philosophy of organism could also provide a basis for a metaphysical description of modern quantum theory. Introduction. There have been countless discussions about the implications of physics, especially quantum physics, for various issues of human understanding. <clears throat> the first, regarding time, it has been argued that modern physics shows time as we experience it to be ultimately unreal. Regarding consciousness, it is thought that any philosophy of mind to be compatible with modern physics must regard conscious experience as a byproduct of the brain's subatomic particles. Daniel Dennett. Regarding freedom, it is thought that any understanding of reality based on modern physics must rule out the possibility that our decisions truly involve self-determination. In light of these supposed implications, it is widely assumed that the worldview that takes physics seriously necessarily contravenes the worldview of ordinary human understanding. And here we come to all the layman's books in quantum mechanics. They all hint to that. Whitehead's philosophy rejects all three implications. They are example of what he calls the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. 
meaning the error or mistaking the abstract for the concrete. Whitehead wants to unify different views of nature and to overcome the dualistic tradition of Cartesianism in modernity. This concerns in particular the dualisms of body and consciousness, nature and mind, and the inorganic and the organic. Their substantial separation prevents the understanding of their connection. In the first place, there is a claim to unity. One can summarize his efforts against dualism into three distinctions. First, the ontological dualism. This denotes the absolute difference between an infinite and limited substantiality. Three, two, the ontic dualism. This denotes the absolute difference between the physical and the spiritual being. Three, gnosiological dualism. This denotes the absolute difference between two kinds of knowledge, different in nature, between rational grounds and grounds of experience. Unity of reason composes the ideal, despite placing the concept of an actual occasion in the center of his philosophy, Whitehead succeeds in resolving handed down contrast in a common framework. It is interesting that Whitehead's starting point in the analysis of the ideas of the 19th century resembles that of Friedrich Engels. Both selected a nearly identical group of scientific advances, which they saw as deciding factors in the transition from Newtonian to modern science. Atomicity, continuity, energy preservation and evolution. In addition, Whitehead's philosophy of experience resembles dialectical epistemology in stressing the role of negatives. I think we continue in the next lecture. I say thank you very much and I wish you a very pleasant afternoon which we're coming to.